so, so we have been, at various times in the service, uh, we have been praying for um, the world and different places around the world. And today, our focus is on Egypt. And uh, so we want to pray for the nation of Egypt. There's been the country of Egypt. There's been a lot of uh, turmoil <laughs> through the years and uh, much need for the gospel there. But also, we've added to our praying around the world, we've added to praying for our summer missionaries. Um, Caleb and Daniel will, be, Daniel will be in Southeast Asia, and Shelley will be in Romania, and Matthew, who happens to be here today with his mom, it's good to have you back, Matthew, is going to Italy, and uh, so we're going to be praying for them. But we're expanding even further, because in on June the 9th through the 13th, we will be involved in summer missions as a church. We will be doing a missions vacation Bible school at Sand Hill Arms Apartments in Stark. And uh, so that will take place during that time. And we'll be telling you a lot more information. But it's not a, it's not a project for a few. It's a project for our Adenton Baptist Church. And so we want as many people to be involved. And again, we'll be telling you more information about that. And then... As the service closes today, as you leave, there will be individuals at each of the doors as you go out, and you will be presented with, for each family, uh, a baby bottle. And uh, it's called, it's for the Starkville, Starkville Pregnancy Resource Center. And put your change in it, put a check in it, put whatever. And, and we're going to, you can keep it from now until Father's Day. And then we want you to bring it back. And then we will give this offering to the Starkville Pregnancy Resource Center. And so a great ministry and opportunity for us to support them. You say, how you are asking us to give and give and give. And you know what? God is blessing and blessing and blessing. And I'm telling you, any time the church gets their eyes off themselves and onto the world, you, all you can expect to happen is God to be glorified. Amen. And, and what ends up happening, the little things that agitate us so many times, we don't see it because what we're, our eyes are on the world. And so that involves going, it involves giving, it involves praying, it involves you and me. And so I just, uh, I'm going to keep doing it. We're going to keep watching God bless. And ultimately, souls come into the kingdom. And that's, the, that's the goal. And God's glorified. So let's pray together as we begin today. Father, I just praise you for this time of worship today. Thank you for the ability to be here today, the privilege to be here today and to worship you. Thank you for what this day means to us, Lord, uh, on the scale of our moms and just understanding the significance of that and being able to honor them. And we praise you for our moms and our lives, Lord, and the impact that they've had in us and on us. But thank you that we can be here to worship today. Thank you for the Songs of praise that we have lifted. Thank you for the witness of baptism and individuals coming into the kingdom and professing that before us. And or the, the gospel that is seen in that, that we can see it and even receive it. And the possibility that someone here today, Lord, has encountered the gospel maybe for the first time and heard you calling them to yourself and praying, God, that they believe and come to faith in you even today. So we praise you for that. Thank you for the opportunity to pray around the world. We pray for Egypt today. There's so much political turmoil in that nation over the last few years. Where the church is present, but it's nominal, it's, it's cold, needs revival. And so we're asking that you revive that church and that, that individuals, the believers that are there, would experience renewal in their own lives, Lord, and have a vision for their country, that they would be witnesses in their own land. Pray for missionaries that go, for people that go there, Lord, to just be tourists, that while they're there, they have opportunity to share the gospel. Lord, would the gospel flood that place, and people believe as they hear and be saved. Thank you, Father, for our, our summer missionaries, those in being our BSU students. And I pray for them, Father, as they, as they will go in, in a few weeks, that you'll help them as they continue to prepare and as they go training and then they leave. Pray for all the details. I pray you protect them physically, Lord. Keep them safe. But, Lord, glorify yourself in and through them. Use them, Lord. And may what you do through them result in people hearing and seeing the gospel and being saved. 
So we lift them to you. I pray for our church, an opportunity we will have uh, to invest in the lives of hundreds of family members, of people, and, and over 100 children this summer in Mission Bay BS. And so, God, prepare our hearts for that. Call us out, God, to go and to be involved in that. And I just pray that as we make preparation and as we get ready, may our, may our primary preparation be to pray and to ask you to move and work and have your way, God. And may, may we see people come to know you as a result of what will happen in that. I pray for these baby bottles that will go out. I pray that you will multiply the money that is given and you will use it greatly to support that ministry is seeking to help those who have unwanted pregnancies and just helping them through that time, Lord. And then the placement of those children or their decisions to keep their children, Lord, and just... We just want you to move and work and bless them in what they do. God, may lives be changed and transformed because of that. And I just thank you that we have, we have such the blessing and the privilege to be able to pray. And Lord, to call on your name on behalf of these. And so we do not take that lightly. And we say thank you, Lord, in advance for what you're doing. Now, Father, would you open our hearts and minds to receive your word. May you show us what we need to see in it. May we hear what you want us to hear. May our lives be transformed, God, as we leave from here today, because we encounter you and your word. We hear your spirit as you speak, Lord, and we respond in obedience. So help us to do that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis is going to be our text for today. You should find that in your Bible, if you will. The very, in fact, Genesis 6 is where we will uh, land in a minute or two. I appreciate Tom uh, leading last Sunday morning. Uh, his taking care of uh, not only sharing the word with you, but also honoring our high school graduates. And I regret that Lisa and I could not be here uh, for that, but I'm grateful for what he did and, and for those students and where they're headed in their lives. You may remember the week before uh, that, that, that I began a series of messages that is focused on generation. One of the things I did a couple of weeks ago was to take you to various passages in the Bible that talk about what we, though there's multiple generations here, but showed you verses from the Bible that describe what all generations have in common. And showed you various passages from one we're going to look at today all the way into uh, the book of Philippians where we're just describing the, the, the generations of time and and one of the things that we, that we saw, even in what Paul wrote in his letter to Timothy, was that he said that, that this is what's going to characterize the end days. And he gave this whole list of, of so just some horrible things. I mean, not really positive. They're not good. And in fact, he even ended in that, in that section, in chapter 3 of verse 13 of 2 Timothy. And he said, you know what? Things are, are going to go from bad to worse. And it doesn't seem like a very very pretty picture. But here's the, here's the reality of the reality is, is that God has intervened in those generations. Brian prayed in his prayer after the baptism about God, and even mentioned it with regard to Ellie, about God pursuing, and, and that's characteristic of God. That's who God is. That's what God has done. From the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, God is seen as a God who is pursuing lost humanity, sinful man, in order to see man restored unto himself. And the reality is, if, if you've trusted in Christ yourself, if you're a believer and a follower of Jesus, then it's because God pursued you and you responded to him in faith and repentance. And you are where you are today because of what God has done in your life, all because of what he did uh, through his son, Jesus Christ. And so I'm thankful that even though I read passages that give me descriptions of our generation that is to come that is horrible and is difficult and going to be going to be devastating in many ways, I am thankful that in the midst of that we still have the good news of salvation and the gospel that goes forth. And even no matter how bad it gets, there's still hope because the gospel is still relevant and still available today. And so, so God is a God who pursues us. And so the whole picture of that message was just to get a picture of a way of defining our generation. Well, the second part of this series on generations, the second part of this has to do with not just defining generations as a whole, but it's asking the question, how are you defined in your generation? 
How are you defined? Defining you in your generation. And what does that look like? What do you look like in the midst? You know everything that's going on around us. And the reality is, the reality is that some people go along with the crowd. Some people get lost in the crowd. And other people are standing out in the crowd. And, and the fact is that what God desires for us as followers of Jesus, not that we follow the crowd, not that we get lost in the crowd, He wants us to stand out. He wants us to be different within the generation. I mean, the fact is, when God saved you, He didn't take you out of the generation that you were a part of that's described as what we found in the Bible. But the fact is, what He did was He left you here. We'll talk about more about why next Sunday morning. But it's just important for you and me to ask ourselves this question. So how are we defined in our generation? And I want, to, I want us to look at that by looking at the example, an incredible example. that's found in Genesis chapter 6 and verses 5 through 9. And I don't want us to just look at this example. I want us to learn from it. I want us to look at what characterized Noah, and then I want, to ask, I want us to ask ourselves, so what characterized him, can it characterize me and you? Should it characterize us? And if so, how? And so I don't want us just to look at it, I want us to learn from it. And so we'll do that hopefully as we, as we walk this. Look at, look at verse 9 in Genesis chapter 6 to begin with, if you will. It says, these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless, my translation says, blameless in his time, yours probably may say, blameless in his generation. And then it just simply says at the end of verse 9 that Noah walked with God. I want you to notice the simple phrase that Noah was blameless in his generation. I mean, what an incredible assessment. Do you remember how his generation was described? Look at verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then look at verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God and the earth was filled with violence. There's also a verse about Noah that's found in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. We're, we're told that Noah, in that time, was a preacher of righteousness, but we're also told that in that setting where he was a preacher of righteousness, that what characterized his generation was that they were characterized as being ungodly. And so you've got all this going on, all of this that is descriptive of the generation in which Noah lived, and yet we are told that Noah was blameless in his generation. Just think about that. I mean, it's incredible. When everybody else is something else, Noah is blameless in his generation. I take the word in, I take it to mean before, among, in the midst of, before their eyes. He is living this out. He is, this is how he is characterized in front of everybody that is in his generation that is even described as we as we looked at. I mean that just that just absolutely blows my mind. You know why? Because I have to ask myself, would I be one when everybody else is doing something else, could I be the one, would I be the one that would be described as being blameless in my generation? Look at the word blameless. You know what the word means? It has the idea, it could even be translated perfect. It, it has the idea without blame. It has the idea of being without fault. I mean, we're talking about someone that is being described in such a way that if you were to look at him, you would say, I, I don't see any fault in him. I don't see anything that is blameworthy in him because how he is living his life in his generation. Now, the question I have to ask myself is, is so why is that so and how is it so? How could it be that he was described in this way? Well, look at verse, uh, look at the text again in chapter 6. There's a phrase that comes before, there's a word that comes before, blameless in his time, and a phrase that comes after that I think really explains how and why 
Noah was blameless in his generation. Look at verse 9. It says that he was a righteous man. In fact, if you were to go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7 or 8, what you would find there is that Noah is mentioned in this roll call of the faithful, where he lists all these individuals from the Old Testament who had faith in God, and they pleased God, and their lives were characterized by, by this faith. And it is said of Noah that he was a man of faith. Why is that so? Look back at verse 8. It says that Noah found favor or found grace in the eyes of God. Simply what he's describing is that he is saying to us that at somehow, some point in Noah's life, that he came to the place where he believed in God, resulting in his having a relationship with God, his being reconciled to God. We would say he was saved. We would say that he was born again, however you want to say it. You say, yeah, but how? That's a, this is Old Testament. Jesus hadn't come yet. No, I understand that. But everybody in the Old Testament that had a relationship with God, that came to faith in him, were looking forward to what God would do through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Just like we today, aren't we looking back to what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross? The cross is central. It's all pointing to him, whether it's Old Testament or, or New Testament. In fact, it's said of Abraham that he believed mm -hmm. God and it was credited to him was righteousness. And if you look at that in the context in those chapters in Genesis where that is said, what you understand is that what he's being told is <laughs> there's coming one who's going to be the Messiah, who's going to be the Savior of mankind. And Abraham's response was, I believe you, God. And the result was it was credit to him as righteous. In other words, he was restored in a relationship with God. And that's what's true of Noah here. Noah had a relationship with God. And the very reason that he could be blameless wasn't because he was better than anybody else. In fact, when I look at this experience of, of Noah in his life, the reality is that it wasn't that Noah was better. Noah was just as bad as everybody else in his culture. He was just as sinful at some point, and he responded to whatever God was doing in his life. However he was exposed and came to know God, he came to that faith and belief in him resulting in, in his being made righteous and his being brought into a relationship with God. I don't understand how all the details work. But you go back and read those early chapters of Genesis, and God made himself known. God revealed himself. Did the same with Cain and Abel. Cain rejected it. Abel believed. Abel's in the roll call of faith and in Hebrews chapter 11. And it says he had faith in God, and that's why he was righteous. Brought into a right relationship with God. Does that make sense? That's why he could be blameless. It wasn't something that in and of himself that he achieved. It was something that he received as a result of his relationship with God and his being restored and brought into a relationship with God. In fact, you know what the real, the real reason is that he was blameless? Is that the blameless one had put his blamelessness on Noah, and that's why Noah was blameless. And you know what? This is what's interesting to me. I don't think his culture, his generation, was the one that said, oh, Noah, you're blameless. This is God's assessment of Noah. I think, the, I think his generation was put off at him. I don't think they cared. They rejected what he said. At least that's my understanding. That's how I would assess it. But God's assessment of him was that this man, in a generation whose thoughts are evil continually, that this man is blameless. He's living out his life in a blameless way in his generation. That is absolutely incredible. And that's what God expects of you and me. If we've named the name of Christ and we are born again and we have been made right with God and we are righteous before him, the result is, the, the, the reality is that what ought to characterize you and me in our generation in which we live, we ought to be seen and acting and looking like that we are blameless in our generation. Well, there's a second reason. Look at the text again in verse 9. Not only was it that he was righteous, but it also says that he walked with God. I wonder what that looked like for him. He didn't have, he didn't have a leather-bound Bible. But we're told in the text that he heard God speaking, that God was speaking to him. Obviously, there's communication, there's relationship. There's dialogue in some way between, between Noah and God, and there's this relationship. He had faith in God, and he is living out this faith in his life, and Noah is walking with God. In fact... That walk also was characterized by obedience to God. If you were to pick up 
in verse 9 and read through chapter 7, you will find this phrase repeated several times. And God said to Noah, and immediately, and God did what Noah said. Absolute obedience. And so God says to him, and then God, then Noah does what God says to him. It is obeying him. It is doing what God has said to him. And so this walk with God involved his faith and living that out, but it also involved his obedience to God. But you know what I also think about that? When I look at him and I try to think, okay, Noah, what did that look like in your life? And on a daily basis was that he is, he is seeking to conform himself to the will and the word of God, whatever God is speaking to him. Do you remember how I, I told you from the, the book of Judges that what characterized the people of the time during the Judges was that everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Remember that? It's in chapter 17 and, the, and in chapter 25 of the book of Judges. Everybody is doing what's right in their own eyes. Well, here's what was true of Noah. If everybody in Noah's day is doing what is right in their own eyes, Noah is doing what is right in the eyes of God. Noah is following what God is saying. Noah is doing what he's hearing God saying, and he is living that out in his life. I mean, when I look at that, and I, and I apply it within our lives, it, 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 what it amounts to is you and me taking our lives and conforming ourselves to what God commands of us and what God says to us. It's like I've said before, it's bending ourselves to the Word of God rather than trying to twist and distort the Word of God to accommodate what we want. And Noah, he was diligent to obey and to follow and to do, and he is blameless within his generation. Man, that ought to characterize you and me. It ought to be what, what people see when they, look at, when they look at our lives. You know, I got to thinking, his blamelessness in his generation wasn't just how he lived his life out among the people that were around him. It included his family as well. His wife is never mentioned, but can you imagine what it was like for her to follow what Noah was saying, God was saying to him, to build an ark, fill it with animals, and now we're going to spend the next hundred plus days riding this storm out on this shut up within this place. Yeah, his sons were there and their wives were there. I just cannot imagine what that was like. Man, she had to have trusted him as a man of integrity, as a man who was in touch with God. She had to have known that he was hearing from God and that what he was doing was true to what God was saying and that he was following him faithfully and she is willing to follow along with that. I had never built an ark, obviously. But I think about my own wife and, and how many places we've been over our lives and pack up and move and leave friends and family and, and just move and go somewhere else. And I remember when we left here, uh, the first time that we were here, when we moved away from here, we didn't have a house on the Gulf Coast. We, didn't have, we went and stayed for just a few days with a family that was there. We were homeless. We had everything that we packed up in, in the moving van, and we're moving there. Lisa's upset with me because we're leaving her friends and everything going to place. We didn't know anybody, and we're doing all of that. And yet, because she trusted me to be able to hear what God was saying, she followed me. And we've done that more than once. When I resigned the church in Ocean Springs, when I resigned the other church in Ocean Springs, we stepped out to follow God in our ministry, and, and she's following along. And I don't take that lightly. But that requires something of us. And what I see in the life of Noah is his blamelessness in his generation. And that included his family. Before his wife, before his sons, before his daughter-in-laws. And that was true of him. And I, 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 look at, I look at how we are challenged. And there are so many things in our lives that we face, every one of us. So many different things that come our way. So many things that you struggle with, that bombard you. So many things within this world that seek to cause us to be conformed to the ways of this world. The ideologies and the philosophies of this world that seek to press us into their mold. That seek to occupy our minds and to take control of us. And living blamelessly in this generation means that we are fighting those things, that we are standing against those things, and that what we are doing in turn is, is that we are conforming ourselves to God in His Word rather than what's coming at us and what we're hearing from the generation in which we live. And that's a challenge. 
That's no small task. That's, that's something that we can't do in and of ourselves without the help of the Holy Spirit within us and God working powerfully within our lives. And so I want to ask you something this morning. I want to ask you, I want to ask you to examine your own heart, to look at yourself, and to ask yourself, how are you defined in this generation? How are you viewed? How does this world see you? How does God see you in this generation? If you name the name of Jesus and you say you are his follower, are you characterized by commitment to God and to his word? Or are you characterized more by compromise to this world and the ways of this world? Which is it? Because I don't really think there's any middle ground. I don't think there's a, a place that you can stand and say, no, I'm neutral. I'm not committed to God, but I'm not being conformed to this world either. That's just not true. You're in one place or the other. We need to be looking at ourselves. You'll hear it next week when we talk about us defining our generation. But we must be concerned about how we are known and how we are defined in the generation in which we live right now. And I'm asking you, it's personal, I'm asking you to search your heart. I'm asking you to ask yourself how you are known here right now if you name the name of Christ. And if it's not commitment to Him, and if it's not, if it's not uh, bending yourself to God and to His Word, then what will you do today to bring about that change? And it may be that you have so given in to, to the ideologies and the philosophies of this world that you're so entrapped but I'm telling you, God is, able, God is able to break those things free and to help us to, to be in a place where we are submissive and yielded to Him and seeing Him work His work in and through us. Where are you right now? What are you going to do if you're not at that place of being known as being blameless in your generation? Then what are you going to do to see change in that? What needs to be repented of? What needs to be confessed to God? What needs to be given over to Him? He might break that free and help, and help you to be able to stand firm and to live in a blameless way in this culture in which we live. We need it. It's imperative. So where, what about you? What about you and your heart and your life right now? Let's pray together. Father, I just want to I just, I just thank you, God, for the example of Noah. I want to thank you, Father, for what you teach us, Lord, about how to be blameless and be and live blameless in our generation. And Lord, I pray you help us to do that. And I pray that you help each of us in this room, even now, Lord, to so look at our hearts and so would you examine us, Father, Father, if, if, if we are more conformed to this world than we are committed to you, may, we, may you show that to us if we don't already know it. And Lord, may we repent of where that conformity is. And Lord, as you cleanse us of that and break us from that, would you then help us, Lord, to be committed to you and to commit ourselves to you, Lord. That we might be blameless in our generation. Father, I pray for, for those here this morning that, that witnessed the gospel and have heard the gospel today but have never believed yet. I pray, Father, that you even now would draw them to yourself and help them even where they are now to call upon the name of the Lord that they might be saved. Lord, help us to love you with all of our heart. Help us to walk with you we might therefore be blameless in our generation. Or we know that there's a world out there that is so evil, that is so corrupt. That there are people in this world that are bound by their sin and need to know that there is hope in Jesus Christ. And Father, we don't want to be a stumbling block. We want to be used by you to be a proclaimer of that good news. So help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. And so I pray that even now, as we hear you speak, that we will respond, Lord, as you lead us. And God, that you would be glorified. That 
you would have more weight in our lives, Lord, than our own personal preference, our own pride, that our, our following you, Lord, would be the greatest thing that we could do even at this moment. Stand together.